Sorry for our last session. Uh, boo, sniff, sniff. We're going to think about uh, circles, lines, and angles. And I hope it interests you, I hope it inspires you, I hope it gives you some ideas to take back to your class. I've had a little bit of feedback from people about things they've tried. Thank you very much for that. I'm always interested in finding out more. Um, I've shown you this slide before, but I think this is a really nice a, a, a topic to, to exemplify this slide. Uh, so, you know, what, what, I, you know what, I want, what I want the students to do is, is like practice circle theorems and practice parallel lines, you know, alternate angles, corresponding angles, um, and the other one, co-interior angles. That's what I want them to practice, but, but that's not sufficient. So really what I need to do is decide what they're going to think. So throughout all these sort of activities we're gonna talk about today, what do I want to think? Well, really, I want to be thinking about making coherent arguments, you know, coherent uh, either purely geometrical arguments or, or a mix of geometrical and algebraic arguments. We're going to look at a, a number of different uh, contexts in which we come across circles, lines, and angles, and some of them will be sort of, as it were, pure geometry, and some of them will be a mix of algebra and geometry. So all these activities, yes, they are procedural. Yes, the students will get better at uh, recognizing side quadrilaterals, recognizing alternate segment theorem, recognizing alternate angles, but that's not really the point. The point isn't really to make them better at doing uh, algebraic uh, geometric questions. The point is to make them think about geometrical reasoning, particularly of the form, if I know this, then I know that. So deductive reasoning. So starting with some, some here's some information, what information can I work out as a consequence of that? What information can I deduce from that? And you'll see what I mean when I look, when I look at the examples in detail. So, 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 so when we go through these when we go through these examples, be, be thinking about how you would you would catalyze that chain of reasoning. You know, so, so folks, so students, you know, you're told this, you want to work out that. How do you get from there to there? How do you get in a coherent, justified way from from the from from the premise to the conclusion? So we're going to look at circles, tangent cores, polygons, polygons that may or may not be regular. Um, what I call angle chasing is not my phrase. Um, so basically a shape with some information and you just kind of slightly cross your fingers and, and work out lots of different angles and hopefully you'll find the one that you want or the information that you want. Um, and I really like doing that. I really just love having a shape and thinking, well, I know that and I know that and I know that and I work out that and I call that that. Um, You'll, you'll see some examples. It's a really good way of developing resilience. It's a, way, a really good way of developing some independence. Uh, and it's a really good example of that deductive reasoning. Well, I know this, so I know this, so I know this, but I'm still trying to get to that. How, how do I do so? So we talked last time about lines being tangents to circles. And we looked at how the fact that if that was the case, then the linear equation and the gym and the quadratic equation would have have a, have a, a it would appear to have only one solution. Obviously, we know actually it's a repeated solution, it's a double root, but it appears to have only one solution, the line and the circle intersect intersecting, because the quadratic, the discriminant, um, will, will equal zero. The, discriminant, the quadratic will have only, only one, have a repeated root. Um, how actually about finding the tangent to the circle? I didn't, I didn't quite have time for this last time, so let me just mention it now. So here is my circle. It's got radius root 50. Uh, it goes through the point we call it negative one seven. And so what I want is the equation of that tangent. That's a really bad straight line, but you know what I mean. Um, and of course, what I know about the tangent, well, what, what, I, what I think about the tangent, whether I know it is a different matter, what I think about the tangent is that it's perpendicular to the radius. What I believe about the tangent is that it's perpendicular to the radius. So the gradient of the radius uh, is clearly going to be well, clearly it's going to be negative seven. Just out of interest, what do you think your students would say? Would they, do you think they'd probably say, oh, you know, change your mind, change an X, or, or rise over run, or along the corridor, up the stairs? Um, it'd be really good to get them talking about rate. So the gradient is the rate of change of Y with respect to X. For, for a step of one in the X direction, or negative one in the X direction, how does the Y change? So this is, this is a change of seven in Y, per for every one in x. Um, and, that, and if, they're not, if, they if they're not thinking of gradient as rate of change, you know, with the last few weeks left with them in year 11 or a whole year of year, year 10s, um, really try and, and get them to be thinking about that. It's, it's gonna be so powerful when, when it comes to sixth form, if they can think about, about, about the gradient of, of the tangent of the curve, you know, the dy dx being, being a rate of change. So if they're saying change in y, change in x, or, or, or rise over run, to get, them to start, to get them to start talking about the change in y per 
unit per one change in x. So that gives us the gradient of the tangent is going to be one seventh because the product of the gradients has to be negative one, one gradient is negative to the other. And as I said last time, I would write down y is one seventh of x plus something. And then I would just jump straight to 7y is x plus something. And I'm not going to write c in 7c. I, I'm not trying to say that the second something is seven times the first something. One's one something, one's another something. It just makes life procedurally easier. Uh, then I substitute in, I substitute the values in. And so I'm going to get uh, 49 is negative one plus something. So the something is 50. And so I'm going to get 7y is x plus 50. Now, actually, it wouldn't be a bad idea to check this is a tangent by now solving it simultaneously with the circle and, and checking that you get a quadratic with a discriminant equal to zero. I'm not going to do that, but you might want to check that it is a tangent. What I want to do, though, is think about this, this perpendicularity. So why is a tangent perpendicular to the radius at the point of tangency? Or how do I know, not, not think, not believe, how do I know that the tangent is perpendicular to the radius at the point of tangency? And it's a nice argument. It's a proof by contradiction, which you, if you teach sixth form, if you remember from your own mathematics education, <clears throat> it's quite a powerful technique. It doesn't need dressing up like that. It doesn't need naming it like that. I think it's a good way of, of, of getting this geometrical reasoning going. So the, the argument is, well, why can't it, why can't it be something other than 90? If, if, if it wasn't 90, um, if, if it was something other than 90, so what? Why would that be a problem? Why can't it be other than 90? So that's the argument we're going, to, we're going to develop. So here's my circle and here's my tangent. And this is where, this is where being not very good at drawing is quite helpful. And here's my radius. I'll do it slightly better than that. Here's my radius. Go to the center ish. Um, and there's my angle. And my angle is, is less than 90 degrees. OK, it could be more than 90, but if it's more than 90, just do it on the other side, just, just reflect it. If, it's, if the angle is not 90, then, then one of the angles, I, either that angle or that angle, is going to be less than 90, and also will work on the less than 90 side. So the argument to develop with the students is, well, it's, let's assume it's less than 90. Let's see why it can't be less than 90. What, what goes wrong if it's less than 90? Well, it seems okay to me, so there's less than 90. Well, that means what I can do is I can make a triangle. I can, I can drop a perpendicular. I can, I, can make, I can make a 90 from the center to the, to the tangent. Uh, so that, that purple point there, that, that, that point there, that blob there, um, represents a point which is on the tangent and which is, uh, or, or which does make a right angle with, with that line from the center. Uh, and that's perfectly possible because if the orange angle is less than 90, then I can then I can make a right angle triangle using it and another angle and a right angle. So I can definitely do that. So what, what's 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 the problem with that? What's the problem with this triangle where that's my angle less than 90? That's my that's my my point there. That's my center, uh, and that's my tangent. What's the what's the problem that was wrong with that? Uh, well, let's just think about, about some lengths. Um, so that length there is the radius. That is the radius because it's going from the center to, to the point of tangency. That definitely is the radius. So what about this length here? Well, I don't know what it is, but I know it's less than the radius because I know that the hypotenuse is the longest side of the triangle. So this side is less than the hypotenuse, i.e. this side is less than the radius because it's got to be less than the hypotenuse because the hypotenuse is the longest side of a right angle triangle. Okay, so this side here, this length here, is less than the radius. So what? Ah, that means the purple point can't be outside the triangle, outside the circle. So if that length there is less than the radius, then the purple point has to be inside the circle because it's not far enough away from the center of the circle. So actually, what has to happen then, so the, so the problem is that the picture has to look like this. Where the purple point is inside the circle. Now that's fine, the purple point can be inside the circle, but then what's the tangent going to do? It's going to cut the circle again. 
or, or stop in the middle of the circle for some, for some obscure reason. It's not going to do that. Uh, so what's going to happen is if the purple point is inside the circle, then when the tangent carries on, it's going to cut the circle again. So it's not going to be a tangent. So that's the problem. That's the OMG, as I believe the young people like to say. That's the problem, is that there'll be a, there will be, there has to be a, a, a crossing point. So it has to go into the circle. That's OK, it could go into the circle. But then there has to be another crossing point when it comes out of the circle. And that means it's not touching the circle. That means it's not a tangent. And I think it's something worth developing. So it is a proof by contradiction. You could do it formally, assume that blah, blah, blah contradiction. I think a better way of phrasing it is, well, let's just see what happens. Why can't it be, if that was the case, what would happen? that we hit a problem i think saying i think saying it for you know feeling year 11s year 10s hitting hitting a problem hitting 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 a, a challenge is better than hitting hitting a contradiction i don't i'm not sure they're very familiar with the idea of, of contradictions so i think that's an argument worth sketching because it's a type of mathematical argument they don't normally come across in other contexts Okay, so let's think a bit about circles and circles intersecting let's just think what's going on with circles and circles intersecting now, there, there is an argument here, which is, so how do they even know these, these are a circle? Well, you could, do, you could get them the complete square. Remember, we have done some complete square practice. So they could write this as x take away 1 squared plus y squared is equal to 9. And then this one is um, x take away 6 squared plus y squared uh, is equal to 36. So the complete square. But how are they supposed to know that that's a circle center 1, 0, or center 6, 0, with radius 9 and, ra and, and radius, uh, sorry, that should be 16, sorry, that should be 16, uh, radi radius 4? How are they supposed to know that? Well, the answer is they're probably not really. And that's where good old trusty Desmos comes into play. So I'm sure you know about Desmos. Um, when I send you the slides, that's a link. So I've made a page, which I think I've shared successfully. You might need an account, but they're free, so why not? Um, so I've made a page which you, which you can have a look at, which has got, and I've got some screenshots from it coming up in a moment. So you can play around with this to, to your heart's content and you can show it, show it, show it to, to the students if you wish to. I have no, I would have no difficulty saying, look, that looks like a circle, doesn't it? It looks quite like a circle. Let's just put a Desmos and check. Oh, a circle. Oh, interestingly, it's one to the right. We might have thought take away one is one to the left, it's one to the right. Um, I'm not going to pursue that in detail now. That's something you'll just, you'll explore in more depth in sixth form. You could tell them. Hint, hint, do A-level maths. Um, so I think you just want to either show them it's a circle or tell them it's a circle, but in the end you want them to realise that the picture looks, looks like that. You have a circle centre 1, 0, radius 3, and a circle centre 6, 0, radius 4. Okay, so let's, let's find where they intersect, i.e. let's solve them simultaneously. Uh, well, this is quite nice and easy, so we just subtract. So, and then I'm going to get negative 2x subtract, negative 12x is 10x, and I'm going to get negative 8 subtract, negative 20 is negative 28. And so I get x is 2.8. So they so when x is 2.8, and then if x is 2.8, what's the y value? Well, I'm going to substitute it back in. So if I substitute it into the first equation, I'm going to get 1.8 squared plus y squared is 9. Um, and that tells me that y squared is 9 subtract 1.8 squared. Now obviously they're going to go for their calculator, stop them, they don't need to do that. Difference of two squares. This is 3 subtract 1.8. This is 3 plus 1.8. So using the difference of two squares, the numbers. Obvious to us, very not obvious to the students. And so we get uh, 1.2 times 4.8. And this works nicely. I built this question nicely because obviously 4.8, 4.8 is four lots of 1.2. So that's what I'm going to get here altogether is four lots of 1.2 squared. And so y is positive negative two lots of 1.2. So it's positive negative 2.4. So x is 2.8 and y is positive negative 2.4. And then if you look at Desmos, you can see that because uh, the, there are the intersection points and there is the line 2.8 and you can see it's about 2.4. It's, it's, it's more convincing on, on a bigger graph, but obviously you can, you can see that. Uh, there is the center one zero and there is the center six zero. Um, and yeah, it's all, all, all well and good. Um, so we've, we, we, we've, we've solved simultaneously. We, we found the X values, we substitute that back in and find the Y values. Okay, so let's do the same for this problem then. Uh, so same idea, we've now got X 
oh no, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't mean this problem. I mean so so, so this is this is what this is you can see because x and y is, is the second circle is up is up up in the quadrant. So it's the same, it's just algebra, so it's the same mathematics as the first problem, the previous problem, it's just algebraically a bit fiddlier. It's a bit, bit, it's a bit, it's a bit more complicated. Let's come back to this problem though. So this is x take away one squared again plus y squared is nine and now i've got x take away uh eight squared plus y squared is equal to 16. so same radii but i, I just shifted the second circle along a bit so now when i do the subtraction i now get uh Obviously, they're going to cancel again. I'm now going to get 14x, and then negative 8 subtract 48 is negative 56, and so I get x is 4. And then if I substitute it in, I'm going to get 4 subtract 1 squared plus y squared is 9. So I get y squared is 9 subtract 9. Oh, okay. So I get y is 0, not, not, not plus minus 0, I just get 0. Oh, okay. So why is that? So as I was talking about last time, the algebra has, has done something. What does that mean geometrically? So the algebra has got one solution. What does that mean geometrically? That means one intersection. But how can that be? How can two circles intersect only once? Surely if they kind of go in, then they're going to intersect again when they come out. And so what, they, what you want them to realise is that that means they must touch. They must have a point of common tangency. And that's what we're seeing there so they, they touch these two circles touch at the point where x equals four and so you could, what you could do is you could either show them it on desmos and say so what does this mean about the algebra it means that when we do the algebra the, the x value we get will only give us one y value or you could do the algebra first and go what does this mean geometrically i've only got one x value one y value so they, they, only, they only cross in one place now that seems a bit weird because as we said if they cross in one place presumably they cross, cross in the second place and so the resolution is they don't cross, they touch. Here, they, they cross in two, different, two distinct places. Here they, here they touch in one place. And you can see what I'm doing as I'm moving the second circle along the x-axis. So then what happens here, okay? So then what happens here is that do the same thing. So now we get 18x subtract 92 is equal to zero and negative eight subtract 84 is negative 92 and so we get x is 92 over 18 which is 46 over 9 which is not very nice unfortunately irritatingly so if you substitute it back in we get x take away one squared plus y squared is equal to nine but actually if you just sort of kind of stop and think about it 46 over 9 well it's more than five isn't it it's more than 45 so this is five point something. So I don't mean if you stop and think about it. Sorry, if you get get the students to stop and think about it. Sorry, a bit rude. If you stop and think about it, no, get the students to stop and think about it. This is five point something. So when I substitute five point something into here, I'm going to get four point something squared plus y squared is nine. That's not possible because four point something squared is sixteen. So when I substitute that in, it's not going to work. I'm going to get y squared is, is nine take away 16 point something, which is less than zero. So the algebra says no solution. How can that be? Well, because the picture looks like that. I've now moved it so far across that they don't intersect. So although I get an x value, I get the x value 46 over nine, it doesn't correspond to a y value. There isn't, there isn't a point on, the, on either circle with an x value of 46 over nine. And I, I just really like that relationship between the, what, the geom, what the algebra is doing, giving you two solutions, one solution, no solutions, and what the geometry is doing, giving you two intersections, one a touching point, tangency, or no intersections. And that's basically it, except there's a rather, rather lovely extra sort of twist to this. Um, and it's perhaps most easily seen here. So if I if I draw that line, if I put that point there um, and just join across, you can see that that's length four. So from that blue point there, that point that cross there at four four, that's the, that's the point four four, um, and that's the point eight four. You can see the tangent. So the tangent segment has got length four. Now if I do the same thing to this circle.
Now, that's a radius, so we know that's three. Now, what's that? Uh, remember, that's the point one zero, so that is length five because we've gone up four and across three. So that's one zero. Uh, great question, Xavier. Um, I haven't thought, actually, that's such a good question. I haven't thought about that. I don't know. I don't think so, no. I don't think so. I think it would look the same, but great question. That's my evening sorted out, thank you. Um, so uh, are you happy that, that, that the hypotenuse is five because I've gone across three from one zero to four zero, then up four to four four, that hypotenuse is five. And therefore that is of length four as well because that's a tangent, so that's a radius, so that's a right angle. So, so, you, so you, 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 um, you, you know that's three, that's supposed to be a tick. You know that's three by the radius, you work out that's five, and then that tells you that that is length four. So what do we notice? We notice that that length and that length is, are the same. So the common tangents, sorry, not the common tangents, the tangents from the same point are the same length. And that is always true <clears throat> wherever you are on this line. So wherever you are, in this case, on the line x equals four, or wherever you are, so if you come all the way up, come all the way sort of up here and join in, draw in the tangents, then those tangents will be the same length. Now, it, it, you, you can see it's not symmetrical. It's not because it's symmetrical. It's not because of symmetry. You know, that's, that's length three, that's length four. These, these, these are not congruent triangles. They might be similar, but they're not congruent triangles. Um, but the point is that on this line, wherever you are on this line, if you draw a tangent to one circle and tangent to the other circle, they will always be the same length. And it's even true here. It's even true over here. So again, if I take, uh, if I take sort of, um, yeah, if I take that point there and draw and draw. He's a turning his iPad around, trying to make it not look terrible. Draw a line like that and a line like that. Then. those lines, those line segments will be the same length. It's always true. It's not obvious and it's quite hard to prove, it's quite fiddly to prove, but it's always true and it's called the radical axis. So the radical axis is the line from which two tangents drawn to the circle are always the same length and it is the line you get when you find a two circle, when you try to find two circles intersecting. So in terms of using it in class, you know, what you could do, you could take, what you could do, you could say, say to students, everyone choose a point on the line x equals four, choose a different y coordinate, and then work out lengths of tangents, and some of them will have to do, you know, have to do Pythagoras on two triangles. So it's really good work on Pythagoras, really good revision of Pythagoras. So you could say, look, choose a point down there, you know, how, what's that distance going to be, what's that distance going to be, kind of like, that's not very well drawn, but you know what I mean. Um, so they could work out the different distances using Pythagoras, and they will, they will all get the same answer. Well, sorry, 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 they'll always get the same answer for the two tangents. And then you have to go, well, why is that the case? So uh, there's lots of practice here about finding, finding lengths on the graph using, using coordinates, uh, culminating in the kind of realization that wherever they are on this magic line, they turn out to be the same length. Um, yes, so you're right, Nicolo, Nicolo the, the, the common tangent is the radical axis. If there is a common tangent, it will be the radical axis. If there's not a common tangent, it might be a common chord. But where it's really interesting is that there's the common neither, and yet it's still the radical axis. Um, uh, so, um, uh, yes, Ben, I think that's, there's, there's a good response to, Nick, to Xavier, yes. Thank you. So that's well worth exploring. Um, you know, six form teachers, you could do that algebraically. Year 11 teachers, I would just do it numerically. Choose a point, choose a point, choose a point, choose a point. Get them to work out the lengths, get them to compare their answers. What's the same, what's different? OMG. Okay, polygons then. Um, so yeah, I'm, they know about cycle quadratures. I'm sure they can do circle theorem questions. So what we're trying to do is trying to make them think just ever slightly differently about, about circle theorems, cycle quadratures, alternate segment, etc. So something like this, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of bar models, so I would be drawing my bar model, my one part, two part, three part, four part. And that adds up to 360, so there are 10 parts. 
So each part is 36. So my angles are 36, 72, 108, 144. So is that a cyclic quadrilateral? Well, it might be, it could be, because if I take those two and those two, then they are 180. Um, and therefore I could arrange it so that they were opposites, so that it was going to be cyclic quadrilateral. And then of course, with hindsight, you can see that coming because one and four adds up to the same as two and three. So the ratio parts make an equal sum. And therefore, when you work out the value represented by each ratio part, you're going to get adding up to 180. What about that? Um, so again, is it cyclotractural? Well, let's draw some sort of picture. So I've got kind of A, B being 16. I've got B, C being, sorry, B, C being 25. I've got C, D being 33 and D, A being 60. Yeah, that's not very well drawn. <laughs> that's 60. Uh, that's 33. And then diagonal 52. Okay, so is it, is it, is it quadrilateral cyclic? I've got no idea. I haven't got a circle here. I've got no angles. Ah, right, I've got no angles. Well, I could work some angles out, couldn't I? So this turns into a cosine rule problem. So, so cosine rule to find that angle and cosine rule to find that angle. So it becomes sort of out of the blue, a cosine rule question. Um, and we'll let them work it through. And probably what they will do is they'll actually work out that A angle A is ultimately not a bit better than that, B, A, D is, and angle B, C, D is. They'll probably work out the values of the actual angles, and then, yeah, probably they'll make a rounding error and we'll get 179.99 or something, like 180.01. Get them then take a step back. Good, what did you, what did you notice? You got cos A was something. You got cos C was something. What do you notice about those? And what you want to notice is that one is the negative of the other. So what should happen to one is the negative of the other, and then get them to think about why that's the case. And that they then obviously they need to know about the shape of the cos graph. And so you can get them to be thinking about well, you know, what what's what's happening when you have two angles which add up to 180. What do we know about their cos values? Well, they're going to be negatives of each other. So you're leading them into some of the properties of the cos graph. I'm not suggesting for one moment do any of the available stuff with them, but just the recognition that you've got two angles who add up to 180, then the cos of one is the negative of the cos of the other. So it's a nice context to get them to come to that, oh, I see, because they can draw the cos graph, I hope, um, but, or, or, or they've plotted it, or they've seen it, or again, they can look at it on Desmos maybe, but perhaps I haven't thought about the implication of it. Uh, I'll leave that for you. That's a little, 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 little question to, to amuse you. You can tell by the font, it's quite an old question. It's quite a, a retro question, but it's just like quadrat rules. It's just, um, uh, I mean, I guess the, 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 give it, the clue is, or the important thing, it, it's a tangent to the circle. So as soon as you see the phrase tangent to the circle, you, you've got to think, what am I looking for? I'm looking for alternate segment theorem setups. So this is the kind of thing I might do, do, do in the class. I might you know, give, put them in groups, give them a big sheet of paper, just say, draw me the picture, draw me what this looks like, and then tell me what the question is, is saying to you. We've got a psychological, so that tells us we're looking for angles, opposite angles, I think 180. And we've also got this statement about, uh, about a line being a tangent. Well, as soon as I see a tangent, what do I know? I know about radiuses being perpendicular, and I know about the alternate segment theorem. So what I would then be doing is looking for alternate segment setups. I'd be looking for shapes like that in the diagram and marking what, you know, the equal angles in from that. So going, well, okay, those angles will be equal, those angles will be equal. How is that relevant to the question? So it's a nice example of, and there's plenty more of them like this, it's a nice example of that sort of, what are you told? What does that imply? With what might become relevant later on? Um, working out angles in, in, in regular polygons, inscribed polygons, so the first one's kind of re relatively straightforward. Um, uh, well, yeah, obviously B is going to be half of C, uh, sorry, half of A, and C and B and C make, make a make a cyclic quadrilateral. Hopefully they can see the embedded cyclic quadrilateral. Finding A actually can be quite difficult. You want them to realize that if you've got two of the, it's, it's basically subtended by, by two of the five sides of the pentagon, and therefore it's subtended by two fifths of the perimeter of the pentagon, and therefore it's subtended by, subtended by two, of, two of fifths of the circle of the circumference, and so therefore it's two fifths of 360. So that idea that it's two fifths of the circle, the idea that that is two fifths of the circle, and therefore that is two fifths of 360, I don't think is, 
I don't think is obvious. Obviously, in my experience, they, they don't find it obvious. They don't see it as being obvious. That's why I think of these questions. And then when we come over here, the sort of extension of it is that something like, say, that angle, Uh, something like that angle and that angle. What do we know about those two angles? And what we know about those two angles, though it's far from obvious, is that they're the same. They must be equal because they're subtended by equal length arcs. So that arc is an eighth, and that arc is an eighth, and therefore they must subtend equal angles. And it's an extension of, of, the, of the butterfly, or indeed the, the bow tie theorem. So you have the, the butterfly or the bow tie theorem that when they're on the same arc, then the subtended angles are equal. But a generalization of that, which I, I haven't seen in many books, I haven't seen it sort of talked about very often, which is why I wanted to mention it today. Um, as a generalization of that is that if you've got equal arcs, so if you've got an arc like that and an arc like that, and they're the same length, then they subtend equal angles, no matter whether it looks like it or not. So the same arc subtends equal angles but also equal arcs subtend equal angles. And therefore, surprisingly, perhaps, those angles must, the blue and the pink angle must be equal. And that doesn't seem to be very well um, dis known, used, certainly discussed in, in, in kind of books. So that's why I wanted to mention it. And obviously once you've got that idea, you can do lots of lovely questions about polygons because the whole point about the regular polygons is they, make, they give you lots and lots of equal arcs. Speaking of polygons more generally then, um, if you if you said to your your year 11s or your, or your year 10s your top sets uh, what word goes there what would they put the exterior angles of polygon uh, good question Susan can I come back to that in a moment thank you Susan good question though uh, what word would you put there the exterior angles of polygon must or always I bet they would yeah and that's really good you want you know I would draw that out okay tell me what word goes there always and then I go let's check it um, and this, I love these pictures. It's, it's not my idea, but it's, ge it's a genius idea of Don Stewart. Don Stewart's, you might know Don Stewart's blog spot. Um, if you haven't come across it, you know, OMG, you've been missing out. So Don Stewart, re I mean, really sadly, he died earlier this year, actually of coronavirus. Um, uh, and, and it's such a loss to the mathematics community. But if you've not come across Don Stewart's blog spot, it's fantastic. He has this genius idea of drawing polygons on grids, on dotty grids because then it just makes the working out really easy. You don't need a protractor. So that is 90, uh, that is 135, that is 90, and that is 45. So we get 90 and 90 makes, ooh, we get 90 and 90 makes 360, sorry, 180, and 45 and 135 makes, makes another 180. So altogether we get 360. So then let's, let's just check that with another shape. Um, so this one, so that's my 135, uh, that's my 135, that's my 45, that's my 135. What do they add up to? Well, 135 and 135 and 135 is, uh, oh, that's a bit weird, that's 405. And then 45 is 450. So hang on, have we now suddenly got exterior angles not adding up to 360? Now, there's a resolution to this, and you may well know the resolution, but you want the students to go, hang on, we've been told for a year, because it's year eight, they add up to 360, and now suddenly you're telling us they don't add up to 360. You, know, you want them to have that, that cognitive challenge, that, that struggle, that desirable difficulty, where they go, what? So everything something we've been told is not true. So the resolution is to think about the direction of rotation. So the the 135 is, an, and is clockwise, the 135 is clockwise, the 135 is clockwise, the four, no, sorry, anti-clockwise, I'm really bad at that. The 135 is anti-clockwise, the 135 is anti-clockwise, the 135 is anti-clockwise, the 45 is clockwise. And so, the, so there, is a, there is something different about these angles, these exterior angles, in that one, by basically because of the reflex angle, because the interior angle is reflex, the exterior angle is going in the other direction. And so we make the decision to call that a negative angle 
and then phew, we get 135, 135, 135, which is 405, subtract 45, which is 360. So that is, that is the correct word with the proviso that we think about the direction of the, the rotation of the exterior angle as well as the value of the exterior angle. Uh, and that I think is probably something they, they weren't have thought about. And the, the, and the way into it is we go, you think this is true, here's an example, what do we do? Either do we abandon the rule or do we adjust our way of counting in this case or calculating in this case so the rule holds true. Susan, great question. Um, so I, I assume since you talk about talk about this thing about about the arcs, I think that's because I think you wrote it when I was talking about the arcs. Um, so I would say equal arcs subtend equal angles. That's what I would write. I would write a possibly equal length arcs. Be really precise. So equal arcs subtend equal angles. That's how I would write it. Equal arcs subtend equal angles at, at the circumference, probably. Equal arcs subtend equal angles at the, circ the circumference. Is that, is that what you meant, Susan? Thank you. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Right. Similarly, interior angles. So, again, same thing. Now, hopefully, this time they might be a bit less ambitious. Uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, Jenny, that, 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 that is, that's a nice thing you get out of it, is about um, thinking about positive and negative angles about rotation without just faff around with trig. So hopefully now they might sort of say always, but a bit more hesitantly because you've now upset them. Could they prove this? Um, different proofs? I mean, the, 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 the classic proof is that proof where you just join, join in, you triangulate the polygon and get your five polygon, get your five, in this case, pentagons, sorry, triangles, five triangles. Um, I like this proof where you go from the center, start at the center and work out, because then what do I do? I've got 180 N, because I've got all the triangles, but I've got these extra ones that I don't want in the center. So I have to subtract an angle around the center, a 360. And then obviously that's the same thing. So I like that one. Uh, I also like the proof up using pairs. So if you think about interior and exterior pairs, then each pair is of exterior plus interior adds up to 180. So my total is 180 N, but again, subtract the ones I don't want, some of the exterior. So subtracting 360, because we now know with some degree of confidence that the angle average 360. Exterior angle, exterior angle under 360. So great, uh, we've got three nice proofs uh, that the angles of, of a polygon always add up to 180 subtract, and, and subtract two. And then you go, what about that polygon? Is it true in that polygon? Is it still true? Because now none of those arguments works. That one doesn't work. That one doesn't work. And that one doesn't work in that shape. So my expectation is my and i think you will probably find that they've only ever really thought about convex polygons a polygon like this is called a convex polygon so my expectation is that they've only ever thought about convex polygons and they haven't thought about non-convex polygons and is this result still true is 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 this result still true and if it is how on earth do we go about showing that it's still true uh, it is still true, <laughs> uh, and a way to think about it is to, is to generalise the idea of triangulation. So sort of something like that, right, so triangulate it like that by joining up vertices to make triangles. And then think about what does that give me? That can, that's going to give me 180 something. How many triangles have I got? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many sizes do I have? So how does the argument work? And of course, once you start triangulating, well, how do you know that your triangulation and my triangulation has got the same number of triangles? You might draw, do a triangulation with 12 triangles, and I might be able to do it with 13 triangles or 11 triangles or even fewer triangles or more triangles. So once, once you open up the possibility that this method is no longer obvious, then there's a whole lot of discussion to be had about, well, does it, does it still work? Is it, is it still true? Um, and the answer is it is, um, and it's, but it's not a very easy argument to prove. 
So think about the exploration, think about the journey rather than the destination, if I can use that cliche. You know, again, to realize that what you want to realize is that these arguments no longer apply. So we need a different argument. And then that different argument may, may, may break down. Also polygons, polygons with holes called, uh, jump my pun, polygons, because they're like polos. Uh, I thought about this afternoon, I was really pleased with that. It's been a long day. Um, so polygons with holes in. So what would we do here? Well, slightly when you think about how we're defining um, interior angles, but what I, would, what I would do is I would say, well, look, they're all the same. So I've already got 90, 90, 90, and um, uh, two, one, three, five. So I've already got 540, which is what I expect is a pentagon. And then I think realistically, you'd say that that's an interior, that's an interior, that's an interior, and that's an interior. You know, from the point of view of somebody on the inside of this pentagon, you know, the point of view of, of people standing, standing there, or people standing there, or people standing there, it looks to me like there are some more walls. It looks to me like there are some more angles. So I think it's reasonable to say that these are the also interior angles. So what do they add up to? Well, we've got a 270 and a 270. Uh, so we've got another 540 and we've got uh, there is so there is a 315 and there is a 225. So that's another 540. So altogether, we're going to end up with a three lots of we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to have the original 540 from the from the original Pentagon. And then we're going to get an extra 180 from from the internal shape, from the internal quadrilateral and something similar here with, with the triangle. It's a bit hard with the triangle because it's not equilateral. I, I could I could make it equilateral. I could stretch it and pretend it's equilateral. Go on, let's pretend it's equilateral. So I'm going to get each of these is going to be 300. And so I'm going to get 540 plus 900. So then the question is, what happens in general? So if you have an N gone with an M gone hole, what happens? Is there a formula? And there is, there's a really nice formula. So something for you to explore, perhaps even with your year 11s next week. Uh, so, there it said, so there is a nice formula. There is, a, there is a hundred, there's a formula with a hundred, there is a formula with 180 and N and M in it for the sum of all the angles, interior angles defined as we have done so here this evening. So def at, counting those as the interior angles. And then the really interesting question is, what happens when M is zero? Because when M is zero, there isn't a hole. So when M is zero, your formula should give you the, the answer of the normal answer, when, when, when there's nothing in the middle, it's just, just the normal shape. So does it? <laughs> you can tell by the way I'm asking, the question is no. Uh, the answer is no. So what happens? So that's something for you to explore and think about. I'm very happy to discuss it either at the end of the session or, um, or by email later. Uh, but it's a really lovely exp exploration. Put the hole in, put the one hole in, see what happens, reduce the hole to zero. Do you get what you expect? No, why not? It's a really lovely thing to think about. Um, so about, about regular polygons, then not, not, not thinking normal things about polygons, regular polygons. Um, what I find is that, is that sort of top sets, um, because they can do the algebra, they just write 180, n subtract 2 over n is 150, and they solve an equation and they get n is something, they're going to get, get, get n is 10, 12, and they kind of like move on. And it's, it, it's just algebra, they've lost the geometry completely. So what I want them to do is, okay, it's fine, but what I want them to do is go, right, interior is 150, so exterior is 30, so n is 360 divided by 30, which is 12. And that to me is much better because that's, that's verifying their geometrical understanding, not just their procedural fluency. And then of course they can do questions like this. So, uh, so that tells me the exterior is 10, that tells me the exterior is seven, and that tells me the exterior is three. So yes, no, yes because 10 and 3 are factors of 360 and 7 is not a factor of 360. And it's just such a nicer argument than, than to try to do, solve three equations and getting values for n which do or don't work. So getting to think about the geometry, not just resorting to algebra. So for example, polygons fitting together. Now, obviously hexagons do, sorry, regular hexagons do, like beehives, they clearly do, but why do they? Well, because that's 120, that's 120, that's 120, so that's why they do. What else does? Well, two octagons and uh, what? Well, what's happening with an octagon? So octagon, for an octagon, the, the, the 
exterior angle is 45 because it's 360 divided by eight. So the interior angle is 135. So there's a 135 and a 135. So that's a 270. And so therefore that's a right angle. And so the missing shape is a square. And then explore more generally, to what and a what do so. Uh, so you want to think about what, what that might be. And you, they might need to build up a table of values and kind of look, look for matches. So two, you know, build up a table of values of interior angles and go two of those and one of those will add up to make 360. Uh, I'll kind of give you a clue. It's, 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 two, it's two pentagons and it's one decagon. Add together, fit together perfectly. Um, and you know, you, you, as soon as you think about the interior angles, you'll see, you'll see why that's the case. Where I want to go with this, though, is what happens in general. If you have a, a P gone, a Q gone, and an R gone, what happens in general? And it's much easier to think about this first the exteriors. So the exterior is 360 over P, the exterior is 360 over Q, and the exterior is 360 over R, because they're regular. And so the interior is 1H, take away that, the interior is 1H, take away that, and the interior is 1H, take away that. And then because I'm going round a point fitting, they must add up to 360. And that simplifies really nicely. So do some algebra, dot, 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 we get one over P plus one over Q plus one over R is a half. Uh, so for example, a sixth plus a sixth plus a sixth, i.e. hexagon, 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 makes a half. So hexagons fit together. An eighth and an eighth and a quarter. So two octagons and a square fit together to make, to make a half. And then that's where the, the pentagons come from because a fifth and a fifth and a tenth is a half. And there are a few others, but not many because P, Q and R can't all be big. If they were all bigger than a si than six, then each fraction would be less than a sixth. And you wouldn't get a half. You wouldn't even get to a half. And even that's quite a good bit, bit, bit of reasoning for, this, for, the, for your year 11, your top sets to, to go through. If each of them was bigger than six, then, then each, each reciprocal would be less than one sixth. And so the sum wouldn't get to a half. So actually, I can't have them all being bigger than six. I've got to have one of some of them being three, fours, and fives. So actually, there's only a finite number, there's a finite set of cases, and it's not that hard to find them all. So you, know, you, you take the idea, a bit of algebra, and then, then think about solving that equation. They could do it by spreadsheet, they could do, they could do a systematic analysis. There's lots of ways of finding the solution, but it's a finite problem with not that many solutions. Can, and there's a nice bit of geometrical reasoning, about, sorry, just a numerical reasoning about what the constraints are. Um, so angle chasing, it, it, and there's lots of examples for you to play around with and share. It's simply where you, you call something, something that you know, um, and then, uh, then just pers persist with it and see what happens. So uh, I, like, I like this one, why, why I put it first. So ABCD is a rhombus, what does that tell me? Uh, that tells me that that and that and that and that are the same length. It also tells me that that and that and that and that are parallel. Okay, and AP is the bisector of DAC. So AP bisects, so that's X and that's X. And that's all I'm told. Uh, uh, hang on, Ben and Amy, can I come back to those questions in a moment? Good questions, or come back, I'll come back to those in a moment. Um, so uh, all I'm told, all I'm told uh, is that it's rhombus and that's bisector. So then what can I work out from that? And this, way, this, this is the chasing. So if those are X and X, then that must be 2X. But that's an isosceles triangle, so that's 2X. And that's a bisector, so that's 2X. And that's a triangle, so that is 180 take away 3X. And then that's a straight line, so that's 3X. Oh, well, I'm done. DPA is three times DAP. And I just, I'm slightly failing it, going, oh, I'm done. But actually, that is actually what happens. They kind of just go on chasing, they sort of go around the shape, and then suddenly go, oh, I've done it, I found it. And it's just, it's, I, I just really like that moment. That's sort of like, oh, I've got it. That's sort of like a surprise moment when they get it. And these all work in a similar way to that. Um, so last, last few examples, think about parallel lines now. So uh, here we've got some interior angles in a ratio. I'm sorry about the, the, my, my type setting, the, 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 th the fourth part of the ratio be on the wrong side. Is it a trapezium? Well, what have we got? 
if, it, if I did my bar model, I've got one and seven and four and eight. So that adds up to, tw I'd have 20 parts to represent the 360. So each part will be 18. So that would be 18. Um, that would be 72. That would be uh, 126. And that would be 144. Is a trapezium. Uh, can we tell? Do we know? Is it obvious? Yes, we can tell. And the answer is no, because if it was a trapezium, trapeziums have pairs of co-interior angles, i.e. angles which add up to 180, and there's no pair there that do. So it's, it's the reverse of the parallel lines, it's the reverse of the co-interior co angles add up to 180, and, and if they don't add up to 180, then the lines are not parallel. So it's the reverse argument, it's the converse, and it's just a nice way, I think, of introducing that. You don't need to draw, you don't need to measure it, you can just, you, you can see that because we haven't got co-interior pairs adding 180, therefore we haven't got parallel lines, and therefore we haven't got a trapezium. What about the next case? Well, this is looking a bit more plausible about the pairs, because I've got the one and the seven and the seven and the one. So again, I've got my, um, I've got 14 and one, I've got 16 parts, uh, adding up to 180, sorry, 360. Uh, so each part's going to be 45. Is that right? 16, 45? No, hang on. Yes, no. Uh, I've, got here. I've got 16 parts adding up to 360. So each part is going to be 22 and a half. I'm really panicking now. <laughs> yes, 22 and a half. Um, so what have I got? Well, actually, the, re the reason why I'm flustered is because I didn't actually bother working it out because I know it's going to make a trapezium because that's my one, that's my seven, that's my seven, and that's my one. And now I have got symmetrical co interior pairs. Yes, yeah, because all four of them add up to 360. One and seven, i.e., eight parts, and one and seven, eight parts must make 180. So I have got my co interior pairs adding up to 180. So the lines are parallel. So it is a trapezium. And then laterally down here, well, now I've changed the numbers around. Does that make a difference? Yes, because now it's not going to look like that. It's going to look like that, one, seven, one, seven. And so what I've got is a parallelogram or possibly a rhombus, not a trapezium. Now, I want, I want the students to work out the parts, work out the angles and get the actual values. Uh, but I want, to see, I want you to see how I built the question. Couple more minutes, folks, if that's okay. If you need to drop out, that's absolutely fine. Remember, I am recording, so if you missed the last bit, you're absolutely fine. If it's just a couple, couple of minutes, if I can have a little bit longer of your time, I'd appreciate that, sorry. Um, then, so if these are parallel, well, just different configurations and, and, the, and the, what, what, what might they do? Well, I could put a third parallel line in there, couldn't I? And then that would be 40, and then that would be 70, and therefore that must be 30. And I could put another parallel, a mutual parallel line in there. So that's 25. So by subtraction, that's 125. And so by co-interior angles, that's going to be 55. So just the idea of, of adding some extra things. And then something similar here. Put that mutual parallel in. Uh, what do we know? We know that BC bisects ABE. So uh, that's X and that's X. And then EC bisects BED, so that's Y, not necessarily X and Y. And so by alternate angles, that's X, and by alternate angles, that's Y. And then sort of we're a bit stuck. What, what, what? We've got an X and an X and an X and a Y. So what? Are oh, there in a triangle? So X and Y and X and Y must make 180. And so X and Y by themselves must make 90. Oh, so BCE is 90. I don't know what either part is, but together the parts must make 90. And again, my experience is that's a rather pleasant surprise. Oh, I don't know whether it's 1630 or 1450 or 1720. All I know is that they have to add up to 90. And then I put a couple more like that in there. So chasing around lots of sort of kind of parallel, well, not, sorry, not parallelograms, but chasing around interesting shapes there. And then something like that. So what are we told here? We're told that AB is parallel to ED, and we're told that BC is parallel to FE. But again, we haven't got the transversal. We haven't got the line. So we need to think about which line should we add in. Something from A to D, maybe. Something from B to E. Maybe, maybe both of them. Maybe we should add them both in and see what that happens. So it's just it's making them amend the diagram and chase around the diagram uh, rather than just 
rather than just being told what to do and filling in because they, they can do the arithmetic they can they, they, they can remember what the shapes look like so it's making them make some choices and see what are good choices and bad choices successful choices and less successful choices so you know i think we're practicing their knowledge you know knowledge of um angles and angles and cycle direction opposite angles up to 180 uh angles alternate angles formed by parallel lines must be equal etc lots of fluency but also their understanding particularly in the sense of mathematical reasoning so we are we are you are developing their reasoning if i know this then i know that if i know that then i know that if i know that then i know this oh right that's what i wanted you're developing them that they're using that i know that and that i know how to tell you i know why to justify their choices so i said this lots of times before get the maths from them um, are you sure? How do you know? Give me another reason. We just did that a moment ago, didn't we? We had the three polygons. Give me another proof. Give me another proof. Give me another proof. Ah, are you sure? You know, so I think of all the topics we've done, probably this best exemplifies the get the maths from them. Are you sure? How do you know? Make up your own, come up with your own examples. Give me another and another and another and another. So therefore, probably it's a good place to stop. Thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed the last few weeks. I hope you have as well. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll come back to Ben and Amy questions now. If you need to drop off, that's absolutely fine. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, those of you who replied to my email about the uh, GC Plus. Um, we haven't said anything to the students yet. We're about to. Um, so and I'll let you know when we do so. So we haven't sent a link to you for your students, but we will do so shortly. I hope some of your students will participate as well. Um, some of you I know are going to come and work on the course with me. That's great. I look forward to seeing you then. Some of you hopefully maybe see at a future a CPD programme at some point uh, in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your questions and your contribution. Um, I'll send the slides out. I'll send the links. I'll send the evaluation. Please fill it in. Um, for the last time for now, bye for now. Uh, so uh, Amy, um, I will stop recording now, um, if that's okay.